Minasan konnichiwa and welcome to the board game dojo's import or not series where we take a look at games from East Asia and let you know if they're worth your hard-earned money to import or not. Today we are looking at Planet a2C, the long-awaited reprint of notoriously difficult and expensive to get Ambient Abyssal. Now, because Ambient Abyssal was so difficult to get, and even if you could get it, it was somewhere usually around $75 to $100 to get it, we're going to go into this review with the assumption that you, the viewer, have not played it before. And so in this video, we are going to take a look at the overview of the game, the hook of the game itself, before going into our thoughts on the game and whether it is worth the money to import this from Japan, especially considering the wealth of great introductory climbing shedding games coming out these days. Just a reminder that we're moving into twice weekly podcasts and a weekly video review on YouTube. So if you want to stay up to date with what we're doing, I go ahead and subscribe to us on Twitter and Instagram because we're always keeping up to date with that, as well as like and subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and here on YouTube. But with that out of the way, let me go set this one up on the table over there and I'll show you how this one plays. Planet Attack is a climbing shedding game, meaning that you're going to play cards by climbing, as in playing a card that is higher than the one that is on the table, and you win by shedding, as in getting rid of all the cards in your hand. Now, the thing that makes Planet Eyuku special is this here, and that is because there are two ways in which you can climb. One is in number, which is pretty usual for a climbing game, but the second is in these suits or colors. And I'll probably say them in between. So for example, maybe you play a gray six. Now usually a six would be the highest card here because the deck goes from one to six. But if you play a gray card, then the next person can maybe play a green one. So the number doesn't really matter because we're actually playing color here. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say that the first two cards on the table that I play is a three and a five. Well, these are not the same number here, so we're clearly playing color because I didn't play a pair of threes or something. So then the next person can play a four and a two. Doesn't really matter to the number here because we're not playing numbers, we're playing colors. And as you can see, red is much higher than green. Now the interesting thing that can happen is if somebody plays a number that is both low in rank and in number, because we don't know yet whether we're playing numbers or colors. So maybe the next person plays something like an orange too. Well, hold on a second, because this is higher in number and it's higher in rank as well. So which one are we playing? Well, we don't know yet. So then the next person will, will come up to the box and say, oh, well, actually, I'm going to play a five. We were playing numbers all along, silly. And that's one of the fun things about this game is that you can go around the table and not sure where it's going to end. Now then everybody can choose to pass whenever they want, or if people can't play, then they clear it off. And then whoever won that last one gets to start on the next one. So in this one, if that's that, then maybe the next player might play this. Again, we're not playing number, we're playing color. This is actually the strongest card in the game. So then that would clear off. The first person to shed their hand wins the round. And depending on if you're playing two players or three players, they get differing amounts of points. In a two player game, you get the number of points that is the round. So in round one, you get one point. In round two, you get two points for winning, so on and so forth. In a three-player game, the person who goes out first gets two points, and the person who comes in second gets one point. In a two-player game, it's the first to ten. In a three-player game, it's the first to seven. And that's how you play Planet et Uck. Now, Planet Etuku is not the first time we have experienced Ambient Abyssal, but it is the first time we're making a video review because we've been a little nervous to actually give our thoughts on it. First reason is that we want to limit the amount of absolutely impossible to import games that we give to you. The whole point of the series is whether it's worth your money to import or not. But the second one is because I think we're in the minority opinion here where we find this game good but falling short of great. Before we get into the gameplay reasons for that, let's go into the production and the art of this new version, which is the one that you're most likely going to be able to get. Upon receiving this box, you're going to see that, first of all, the cards just don't take up a whole lot of room in the box. Now, I have not tried to sleeve these yet, but it looks like it's not going to be that tall, so I would have to imagine that you're going to need some thin sleeves to do it. But besides that, I'm a, 
I kind of get why they do it. I know they're a bookseller, so they want everything to kind of have this nice book look, which I do like. And if you take a look at Twinkle Starship, which is the one that this came with in that kind of duo pack, if you got if you pledged for both, they are the same size for both of them. And Twinkle Starship has a few more components. So, OK, they used this size, but I'm a little bit upset about it because, well, I feel as though my cards are going to get dinged around because they're just going to be bouncing around everywhere in the box. But that's a really minor gripe because besides that, I actually much prefer this version to the original. Again, it's another way that we're in the kind of minority, but I much prefer this artwork to the original kind of jellyfish theme. I think the aliens are adorable in this version. And Sumachan also said that she quite prefers this version as well. Plus bonus marks for making this colorblind friendly. You can, instead of going by the color, you can go by the design of the alien itself so it can play either one. And that is much appreciated. Now, I'm not really going to compare the theme on these because the original didn't really feel like you were playing a jellyfish underwater game, and this one doesn't feel like you're playing an alien game. And I don't think that's really why you're here for it anyway. But the art, that is the only difference between Ambient Abyssal and Planet Etuchu. So if you're wondering about that, there you go. But let's actually get to why you're probably here, which is how does this game play? What is the gameplay like? Now, again, I want to reiterate that we do like this game. We just combined it short of being the masterpiece that people seem to make it out to be. And first of all, I think part of this reason is the expectations that build up over the almost mythology that has been built around this game, which is, I think, a bit hyperbolic, but not quite. You'll find a lot of people paying almost $100 for this deck of cards that would be easily proxyable. So why else if it is not a phenomenal game? And if you were to just search Ambient Abyssal Review online, the only text reviews you find are ones of people who love this game. So it is kind of hard to meet those expectations when you're coming upon it a little bit later. But let's actually explain a bit more specifically why we like but not love this game. First of all, on the bottom of this box, it says that this game plays between two and three people. When you get this game, you can just exit out the two players with a sharpie because this game is a three player only game not at all enjoyable at two the first reason for this is the scoring system as i mentioned earlier it kind of ramps up where round one is one point round two is two points and so on and so forth and i kind of get it because i think it's supposed to be this crescendo that's happening where as you go to the later rounds it becomes more and more important as you're going to play between four and six rounds it is this very stopgap thing and Maybe it also works as a way of teaching the game as well, because you can go, oh, round one, you don't know what you're doing yet. So it's not really that important to win round one or round two. You're kind of getting the hang of it. You're kind of getting the strategies that you might need. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really feel that fun. Now, we tried to change this where it was actually the best out of five. So ultimately, you're going to play between four and six rounds for sure, just mathematically speaking. We'll just play the best out of five. First to three wins, wins. But even with this, it fell quite flat because the gameplay at two is just not fun. And that's because oftentimes the round is predictable. You know when the other what the other person is trying to do. There's a very almost routineness to it. And part of that is that when you are dealt your cards, you oftentimes just know if you're going to win or lose that round. Playing the round almost feels like more of a formality than a necessity. And that is a really weird feeling. Again, that probably just harks back to the fact that it feels routine. There's not really something there that makes people need to make an unpredictable move. But that is fixed in the three player game. And the three player game is where it really sings because unlike the routineness and the predictability of the two player game, the third player introduces chaos. And we talked about this in our trick taking video of five great introductory trick takers. When we talked about trick taking in black and white, that this same thing happens. The third player just introduces chaos to it and introduces this unpredictability to it. When you play a card or two, you're not sure if it's going to make it back to you. And you're not really sure what the other players are going to do. Are they going to keep trying to climb the ladder slowly but surely? Or is one of them going to play that really strong purple or a strong purple six and just clear out the round before it even gets back to you? Maybe you wanted that slow build up. And in a two player game, you probably could have figured out that that was what the other player was going to do. But now you have that third player in there 
that is a complete monkey wrench. And that's why really this is a three player game. You're adding in another suit. You're adding in another number to this. And what that adds is just more variance. It adds more chances for somebody to make a play that you weren't expecting. What three players introduces that really exist in two players but not very often is the smart pass the idea that you could continue to play but you're not going to because you are saving cards for later to hopefully run the table with at three players that part sings as well as the main hook of the game it's really fun when you play down a single card and the next person plays down one that's just slightly higher in both suit and numbers so now hold on we still haven't figured out what's going on yet and then the third player comes in and decides it for you and they might even just end it right there that's really fun the anticipation as it becomes your turn is this going to make it to me am i going to get to decide how to do this can i clear this out and start a little daisy chain of winning hands for me that is where this game sings and if this happened every time if this happened on a consistent basis i think then we could call this game great but it doesn't two things that keep me from absolutely loving this game. The first thing is, is that the hook is itself really cool. The idea that you can play in either suit or number, and you might not always be sure which one you're playing. But this only works if you play a single card. But the fact of the matter is, is that oftentimes you're not doing that. Oftentimes you're playing pairs. And in pairs, you really are deciding straight from the get-go whether you're playing numbers or suit. So the fun hook to it, the thing that makes this kind of like, I'm sorry, what? Is often not really happening. I mean, sure, it is cool when you play two ones and then it's like, okay, I have decided because I want to play numbers this one, I can decide. It's cool when you play two of the yellows and then slowly everybody else can build up, but it just feels like every other climbing game at that point instead of something special. The other thing is, and I think this is probably the more important point, is that oftentimes in both two player and three player games, you kind of know if you're going to win that round or not straight from the deal. It's kind of weird for a Taiki Shinzawa game, but this game feels that if you are dealt a bad hand, you're done. There is nothing you can do about it. You are going to lose. And that is so demotivating because I think a lot of people who are going to be looking at this game are experienced at these kind of games. Or maybe they're looking for a game to introduce people to. And it is just a bad feeling to know that there was no possible chance for you to win that hand. Now, granted, hands move pretty fast, but it doesn't feel any less demoralizing to sit there for five minutes and go, there is, I, I'm not gonna win anything. I, I There's no way. And know that somebody across from you got dealt a couple sixes and are probably pretty good. They got a couple purple cards, I'm sorry, they're going to win this hand. It is just going to happen. And that's a bit strange for Taiki Shinzawa because usually his games have these mechanisms that introduce ways of turning a bad hand into a good one or a bad card, maybe it has multiple ways of use. And you can kind of see it in this kind of introductory way in which, okay, don't worry if you have a one, because if you have like a one purple, that's actually a really strong card if you're playing rank. Like, okay, but there are a lot of bad cards in this, in this one. A one gray is useless, pretty much. A one gray, sure, you can pair that with something, but it's not, it's not a very good card. You're not going to win a whole lot with it. Especially versus somebody who just has a lot of fours, fives, and sixes in their hand. If you want to see this actually played out and they actually make a comment on it, I would check out the Dads on a Map playthrough of Ambient Abyssal, which I will link to right up here. And they actually make the same comment as I just did because I wanted to know if it was just me that was experiencing this happening. And they said the same thing where, okay, yeah. You just had like four sixes. There was nothing we could do about that. Again, I want to iterate. The rounds are really short, but it doesn't feel great. That is just what's keeping it from feeling great because oftentimes this game is still really fun. And I don't want to leave you with the impression that we don't like this game because we do. We probably rank it somewhere around a seven and a half or an eight, which anything that is more than a seven for us, especially like Sumachan, who is very sh like very picky about what games she wants to play. Anything more than a seven is pretty great for us. But you might also be thinking, okay, hold on. 
I feel like I've heard this before, a Taiki Shinzawa game in which you don't quite know the ranking of the cards until somebody else plays their cards. And yes, you probably have, because he also designed Mask Man, which came out six years earlier than the original Ambient Abyssal. Came out almost 10 years ago now. And for us, we actually just much prefer Mask Men at this point. Mask Men feels like there is more that you can do with your hand. Because in Mask Men, you are slowly building up the ranks. You are deciding as a group, as you play cards, the ranking of strong. You're deciding by playing cards as a group the ranking of the colors. And so in Mask Men, whether it's true or not, it at least feels like you have more control. When you are dealt cards, you don't know if you have a good hand or not. You're gonna work hard to try to make your hand the best it can be. And there's that little change that makes Mask Men just feel a lot better. It makes you feel more clever. It makes you feel like you earned your victory rather than just got dealt the right cards for it. And that's something that I really like in these kind of card games. It's something that is a differentiating factor in these games. Now, taking a step back from it, where Planet Cute is supposed to be at its best is for introductions to climbing and chatting. That is supposed to be the arena in which it plays it. And that is maybe why it is the iteration is because Maskman is a little difficult to teach. And by a little, I mean like you're going to need to play a practice game for sure first. If you want to hear more about it, we have a podcast of our top five Taiki Shinzawa games in which we talk about it. And so you can see that Shinzawa took that and said, I'm going to streamline it a lot down and you can now have this game where it takes a minute to teach. Fantastic. A minute teach for an introduction game. You're already on the right track. Thank you so much. But now the question is, where does it fall in the wealth of games that you now have in that arena? Because you have Scout, you have 535, you have Pin Combi Trio. Like, there's so many that are out there now. Where does this fall? And it's interesting because I think for as much as Shinzawa has this reputation of having this overly complex mechanical system, in which some games definitely do feel a bit like that, I think actually the best for a true, true, true beginner, are probably his too, are probably Pin Combi Trio and Planet Etus versus Scout and 535 that feel a lot more like a game that you're going to grow with a little bit more. Do I think that the Shinzawa pair are good games by themselves? Absolutely. Do I think Scout and 535 are good games by themselves? Absolutely. I don't think by picking any of those four, you are going to make a wrong decision. All four games are fun. It's just up to you to pick your flavor a bit. I'd watch out that, again, Planet Etuka is only three players. That is like the only player count we recommended, so it's the most limited of those four. But for a lot of people, it's also their favorite. And that is part of the reason why it was so successful on Kickstarter and so many people are so excited to get their copies. At the end of the day, we give this a one star. We recommend it, but we don't find it to be an absolute essential. Again, we think it's good, but definitely not worth spending $100 for. And I'm so glad that it is back in print so that you can take a crack at it without demolishing your wallet. Thank you so much for watching today. Thank you so much for everybody who has commented on our YouTube channel, on Twitter, on Instagram. Thank you for everybody who sent in questions for our podcast that we did on Wednesday, which is all about board gaming in Japan. If you haven't listened to that one yet, it is a good one. It's a more conversational base, just completely unscripted. So I was like super nervous the whole time, but I thought it was a lot of fun. So go ahead and take a look at that. Thank you so much for watching. Arigatou gozaimashita. Until next time, janne!